This episode of The History Guy brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. For today's episode, we went around and polled some people we know about what they know about Marco Polo. A few of them talked about the app where you can send messages to friends using a video, and some others remember that kind of game of tag that you play in a swimming pool, but surprisingly few mentioned the 13th century Italian merchant, explorer, and writer who so transformed the world. And so today we'll talk about the life of Marco Polo, a life of wonder and adventure that brought together East and West. It is a life that deserves to be remembered. And Marco Polo is a great segue for the sponsor of today's episode because he happened to come up in a lecture in what has become one of Ms. History Guy and I's favorite new things to do, and that is Great Courses Plus. We really just got signed up with Great Courses Plus. It's already been entertaining and fascinating. It helps us do research and get background for what we do here with the History Guy, but it's just an amazing tool for lifelong learners. It's a subscription on-demand video learning service where you can take courses, full college-like courses in hundreds of subjects and thousands of lectures from top professors from all over the world. There aren't any tests or quizzes or anything like that. You can take the courses you want. You can take them at your own pace. You can do it on video or on audio. You can do it on all your devices and your TV. It's a great tool for lifelong learners. There's courses on so many things. There's tons on history. I want to take them all. I just started this one on U.S. military history that's presented by retired four-star general and Supreme NATO commander was a Clark, but Ms. Teach, G and I have been listening to a fascinating course on the economic history of the world taught by the chair of the Department of History at Brigham Young University. And that happened to have a fascinating section on Marco Polo and the Silk Road that we listened to just the other day. But the Great Courses Plus isn't limited to history. There's also science, there's math, there's literature, there's business, there's self help, there's even hobbies. You want to master chess? Learn from an international chess master. There's even a couple of courses in pirates because don't all good stories involve pirates? And the best part is that our viewers get a free trial membership. Just go to thegreatcoursesplus.com backslash the history guy. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com backslash the history guy. Of course, that link is also in the description. We hope that you enjoy it, every bit as much as we have. During the 13th century, Italy was broken into a number of states, collectively known as the Maritime Republics. These states often fought over trading rights in the eastern Mediterranean. During one of the many naval skirmishes of these conflicts, likely in 1296, a sea captain from the Republic of Venice was captured by the rival Republic of Genoa and imprisoned. That captain's name was Marco Polo. Polo was imprisoned for several months in a cell with a novelist named Rusticello de Pisa, who had been captured by the Genoans during an earlier conflict between Genoa and the Republic of Pisa. He had previously written a romance called The Romance of King Arthur that is the earliest known Arthurian romance written by an Italian author. In their months in prison together, Polo related to Rusticello an astounding story. He claimed to have spent the last 24 years traveling to the ends of the earth, including serving in the court of the great Mongol emperor Kublai Khan. Rusticello recorded Polo's stories and compiled them in a book written in Franco-Italian, a literary language used in northern Italy at the time. The original work was entitled Devisement du Monde, or Description of the World, although in English it is most well known by the title, The Travels of Marco Polo. The book became something quite rare, a popular hit in the time before the printing press, and the book made Marco Polo's name famous. And while Rusticello's manuscript is the primary way we know about the travels of Marco Polo, that book itself raises many questions. To start, none of Rusticello's original manuscripts have survived, only various copies that were made in other languages. In the era before printing, books were hand-copied, and the copies were often not exact. Not only could they be errors, but the person copying might also change the work to conform to political or religious ideals, or embellish the work to make it more interesting. These issues were compounded when the work was being translated into other languages. There are even questions back to the source. Some claim that Rusticello might have embellished the work in order to make it more popular, or that Marco might have added embellishments or included stories collected from other travelers. We simply don't know how much of the book is real. Certainly people questioned at the time. Some of them thought it was quite fanciful. It was popularly known as Il Million, which by some accounts meant the book of a million lies. But what we do know is that it was a really great story. In the 13th century, the Maritime Republic of Venice was known as La Serenisma, meaning the Most Serene Republic. The Republic was ruled over by a doge or duke who was selected by a committee of the Great Council, a ruling faction composed of aristocrats whose positions were handed down through generations. 
created at the end of the 8th century out of a need for protection from Lombard and Hun invaders when the Roman Empire's control in the region waned. La Serenisma lasted almost until the 19th century, when it was defeated by the Ottoman Empire and then plundered after Napoleon Bonaparte's invasion of Italy. As a powerful trading empire, the Venetian Republic had an impressive spread from modern Italy through Greece into Cyprus, Turkey, and Ukraine, including Croatia, Slovenia, and Albania. The salt trade developed the region into a center for capitalism and arts. Venice was its prosperous capital, where aristocrats built elaborate palaces and patrons vied over the talents of masters of the fine arts. It also hosted a wealthy merchant class, into which Marco Polo was born. We know almost nothing about Marco Polo's early life. According to the travels of Marco Polo, his father, Niccolo, a wealthy merchant, set off on a trading voyage with Marco's uncle, Maffeo, when his mother was pregnant. They returned in 1269 to find that Niccolo's wife had died and had left behind a 15-year-old son named Marco, who had been raised by an aunt and uncle. From that we can divine that Marco Polo was born around the year 1254. The nature of his accomplishments and the context of the time suggest that he received a good education, learning mercantile subjects like foreign currency, appraising, and the handling of cargo ships. The first part of the book actually counts the travels of his father and uncle before they returned to Venice. The experienced merchants had traveled to Constantinople, then the capital of the crusader state called the Latin Empire, where Venetians held a favored trading status. Seeing political changes on the horizon, they liquidated their assets into jewels and headed east seeking trading opportunities. Trading opportunities kept leading them east until they joined an embassy that traveled to the court of Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan and leader of the Mongol Yuan dynasty. Kublai Khan was at the time the great Khan of the Mongol Empire, considered by historians to be the largest contiguous land empire in history, only ever exceeded in size by the British Empire. It extended from the Pacific Ocean to Eastern Europe and from Russia to Iraq and Afghanistan. While it was won by fighting, Kublai Khan was very interested in religion and quite tolerant of all religions in the empire. He was quite curious about all that Niccolo and Maffeo Polo told him about the workings of politics, life, and religion in Europe. So much so, in fact, that when the Polo brothers told him about the Pope, he decided they should deliver a letter to Pope Clement IV for him. The letter asked the Pope to send holy oil from Jerusalem and 100 intelligent men to explain Christianity. If they succeeded in convincing the Khan that all other religions were false, he and everyone in the kingdom would become Christians. The Poles returned to Venice only to find that Pope Clement IV had died in 1268. The period taken to choose a successor, or sede vacante, at two years and ten months was the longest in history. They weren't able to present the Khan's request until Pope Gregory X was elected in 1271. They were given the oil, but instead of a hundred men, only two Franciscan friars were sent to accompany them. They then set out on their second voyage to return the gifts to Kublai, this time accompanied by 17-year-old Marco. The first of the four sections of the travels of Marco Polo describes the lands of the Middle East and Central Asia that Marco encountered on his way to China, a journey which took more than three years. The two friars only made it a short way on the difficult journey before parting ways with the Polos out of fear for their lives. Marco Polo was clever, skilled at learning languages, he eventually could read and write at least 14 languages, and was a keen observer and storyteller. Kublai Khan was quite taken with the 21-year-old when they first met. Kublai Khan had by then conquered all of China, but some parts of the empire were resistant to Mongol authorities. Kublai sent Marco on diplomatic and administrative missions where a Mongol might not have been accepted. The great Khan enjoyed hearing Marco's observations of the areas, the same observations that would eventually fill his book. In the prologue of his book, Marco explains that he witnessed ambassadors returning to court with no information about their journey other than their business, and that that displeased the Khan. So Marco took note and learned as much as he could about the places and people that he encountered in order to share the information with Kubla. In doing so, he earned the favor of the great Khan and was employed by him for 17 years, traveling all over the empire. The book is full of detailed descriptions of travel, people, and practices. One passage read, It's a very hot region. The fruits of the country are dates, pistachios, and apples of paradise, with others of the like not found in our cold climate. Another describes local animals. First I will tell you of their oxen. They are very large and all over white as snow. The horns are short and thick, not sharp in the point, and between the shoulders they have a round hump, some two palms high. There are no more handsomer animals in the world. He described the making of rice wine. It is clear, bright, and pleasant to the taste, and being made very hot has the quality of inebriating sooner than any other. It's a truly fascinating read, speaking of how ships are made with no iron fastenings, or about heat so intense that bodies are baked. 
interjected into all these specific details are tales of a fantastic nature, such as the old man of the mountain created an artificial paradise of women and milk, wine and honey, and then drugged young men so that they wouldn't know where they were. He used them as assassins, telling them they could only return to paradise upon completion of their mission. One of the more well-known passages describes a rhinoceros, which Marco called unicorns, with hair like a buffalo, feet like an elephant, and a horn with which they do no mischief. He remarks, "'Tis a passing ugly beast to look upon, and not in the least like that which our stories tell of as being caught in the lap of a virgin." One of the oddities that Marco described for his European counterparts was that of paper money, explaining the shape and size, how much they were worth, and how they were printed with a red seal, and anyone caught forging would be put to death. After many years of adventure, the Polos wished to return to Venice, which disappointed the Khan, who was both fond of them and afraid that letting them go might make him appear weak. But eventually they were granted leave to accompany a Mongol princess betrothed to Persian royalty, which happened to be on their way home. The trip took two years, and while at least 600 people, not including the crewmen of the ships, which numbered over a thousand, embarked together, only eight completed the difficult sea journey to their destination. The Poles returned to Venice in 1296. Their families had long given them up for dead, and some stories, perhaps apocryphal, say that they were dressed as Mongols, could barely recall their native tongue. They were, however, rich, having converted their fortune to gemstones. There are a few works in history that are as controversial as the travels of Marco Polo. Both his contemporaries and modern historians still disagree over what might have been real and what might have been borrowed from other travelers, or what might have simply been made up or come as a result of the many different copies and translations that were made. About 150 of those originally handwritten copies of the book are in existence today, and no two are exactly alike. Still, historians agree that there are details within the work that suggest that much of the work represented the true adventures of Marco Polo. Over time, the book had a great impact on European thinking. It changed their understanding of the Far East. It introduced them to new ideas and concepts, and it spurred a greater interest in trade, partly to access the great wealth that he had described being in China. The Polos weren't the only Europeans, nor even the first to have reached the Mongol court, but the popular of the book meant that they were by far the most well-known. And over time, his detailed descriptions of his travels had a large impact on European maps and cartography. Some see he and his work as the spark for the European Age of Exploration, and among those influenced by him was Christopher Columbus. Among Columbus's possessions was a heavily annotated copy of the travels of Marco Polo. Marco Polo was released from captivity in 1299, went back to Venice where he married and had three daughters. He died in 1324 at the age of 70. Shortly before his death, some people tried to convince him to admit that his book was all made up. He not only insisted that it was all real, he said, I have not told half of what I saw, for I knew I would not be believed. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.